All right, folks. Um, what I have planned for today, being that it was like a semi-snow day, I wasn't anticipating a lot of you to show up. Um, I am going to make this video so the rest of the students that miss class will be able to catch up and stay in pace with us. Uh, I hope for it to take no more than 15 minutes, which would leave us about 40-ish by the end of class that I'll leave up for lab three, right? The Excel part three uh, that's due tonight, if I remember correctly, at 11.59. So uh, hopefully you guys have been working on it, have some questions, uh, and those questions might get answered during this exercise, but most definitely will get answered at the end of class today. Oh. Oh, you know what? I didn't post that because I was hoping to finish this oh, okay. uh, last Tuesday in class, but since I didn't get this done, I didn't, I didn't post the assignment. Time. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. Sorry about that. So there was an assignment that I said last Tuesday that I had to create over the weekend, but because I didn't get this done with you guys on Thursday, I didn't bother with uh, well, posting it. Assignment. I already did the Excel that's due today, so. uh, we're going to be doing this part, and then if you want to ditch out early, then that's a okay. That's entirely up to you. Or you can ask other questions that deal with Excel that you might have questions okay. about. Uh, trust me, the stuff that you guys will be seeing, you'll be using over and over in your lifetime, especially as business people. So it's probably a good idea to get a good foundation on using Excel. All right. So uh, this file that I've downloaded came off of uh, Blackboard. Uh, was everybody able to get to this file? As you can see, it's where we last left off in class. One of the things I'm going to do to make life easier for both you and I is to magnify my uh, spreadsheet. Remember, in Excel, we don't call them spreadsheets. We call them worksheets. And down at the lower right corner, there's a plus next to the 100. And what I'm going to do is just click on that, which will make things a little bit larger for me to actually see it. Now I want you to understand that I'm just changing the view but not the size of the font or the column width. So when it goes to print out it'll still look like it would be at hundred percent. All I'm doing is making it larger on my screen because my high resolution has made it harder for me to actually read the fine print if you will. Uh, did everybody get this though for column, uh, sorry, cell B10? Little hash symbols going all the way across? Okay, can you tell me why that's occurring? Because that might vary according to the actual cell's contents. Why am I getting a bunch of hash symbols or number symbols going all the way across the cell? Yeah, my width of my column isn't wide enough to contain the contents of that cell. So they're just saying there's content here. To change the width and do it automatically, I'm going to position my cursor between column B and column C so it's on that boundary and double click. You'll notice you'll get a bar with two opposing arrows. And by double clicking, it should have changed the width to fit the content to the widest entry. I cannot find the Blackboard. Okay, when you log on to uh, Blackboard, you go to week 12. The very first file in there should be week 12. Oh, it's week 12? Week 9. Week nine. nine. Oh, I'm only praying it's week 12. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It feels like week 12. <laughs> yeah, week 9. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so when we uh, were working on this file, I had you guys enter in these uh, values, which we call labels, right? And then this stuff over here would represent what? What's the opposite of labels? I actually used it incorrectly. Values, right? We have cells either contain labels or values. And what's the difference between labels and values? Yeah, labels help to identify the values, but more importantly, they're not used in calculations, correct? And you could think of a spreadsheet program as just a glorified calculator. So these things over here and up across there are considered labels. They help to build our pseudo table, correct? I don't like to call them tables, just rather pseudo tables. Um, and as you can see, when I go to look at the default alignment for the cell content, labels are left aligned, L and L, and values are right aligned. You notice dates are also right aligned. Why are they right aligned? Because Dates can be used in calculations, right? Carl, do you need a copy of this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. 
Uh, and if you log on to Blackboard and go to uh, week nine, right, guys? Yeah. All right, go to week nine, and you'll be able to download the file that we're in. All right, and so when we were working with this, our last, I don't know, area that we wanted to get at was the current price, if I remember correctly. And I said the way we're going to get the current price is we're going to go out on the Internet, Google it, and bring it back. And I showed you some uh, neat things with Google that you realize that Google is not only a search engine, but it's rather involved. You can add different keywords to it, if you will. Uh, so let's do that. Let's go and find the current price for Disney stocks. So let me open up my favorite web browser, if I can find it. In the address bar, I'm just going to go to Google. Now I know I probably could use it here, but I'm not sure if they're still using Google as its default engine. And hopefully it loads up. Uh, I think this one was having an issue. Let me try another one. There we go. Okay, so was everybody able to get to uh, their website? Mitch, you're probably going to need a copy of this. And log on to uh, Blackboard, go to week 9, and download a file called Web in Excel. So when you guys get to this uh, website, and I'm only using Google, but you guys can use uh, Yahoo, you can use MSN, you can use Bing. I just prefer to use Google because of the shortcut that I'm about to show you. I'm going to type in the keyword, or the reserve word, I should say, stock, followed by a colon. Now, I call it a reserve word because this is a word that Google has set aside to trigger an event. That is, when a person types in stock, followed by a colon, then the ticker, I think it was DIS for Disney, and hit enter, Google will find this off of a particular website, throw it right in here on top of their search results, so this way you don't have to click all over the place to get the actual data. It's right there. So I'm seeing that right now Disney's at 56.83. What do we know that's true about stocks? So I'm going to go back to Excel. I'm going to click on cell F7 and type in 56.83. Sorry, 56 and as Megan pointed out, stocks will change all the time. In fact, I could check this a thousand times today and that number will probably change each one of those times that I've changed, uh, checked it. So hopefully by the time I get done creating this table, I will show you a little VBA script that goes out uses my ticker and grabs the current price for me by just hitting a button. But for now we're building up this worksheet. Let's do the same thing for GE. And could you guys imagine if you had a stock portfolio that had more than just six or so tickers? Remember they say diversification, right? So GE is 23 and a quarter. As I hit enter, my active cell pointer is going from row to row to row. Now let me type in TC. Thirty, uh, sorry, three dollars and thirty-two cents. About three and a third. And let me do TGT. I think that should be target. Sixty-six and three quarters, just about. Now last week, if I remember correctly, we talked about something called relative cell addressing. Now if you're just coming into class, don't worry about going out and using Google to grab the results. Just grab the numbers that I posted up on the screen. The important thing is just try to download this file and get to where we're at. But like I said, last week we talked about relative cell addressing. Is that right? In fact, the way we calculated the purchase cost is we said this times the number of shares. Is that right? But we didn't put in the hard values. We didn't say equals 33.71 times 50. And the reason why we didn't do that is because we wanted our spreadsheet to be adaptable. 
that maybe eventually when I add more tickers, the formula automatically exists and then self-calculate. So if I want to do the current value, what would the formula be that I would use for Excel? So I'm going to click on G6, I'm oh, sorry, G7, right? I want to make sure I'm in that cell that's going to contain the value. And I'm going to say that basically G7 equals, so by hitting the equal symbol, I'm going into enter mode. I'm going to enter in a formula. Now I can do it several ways. I can say this equals and then type in the cell addresses, but what's the better way? They still get me the cell addresses instead of typing them in. I can click on them, right? So I can say equals this, so let me click on that. Ah, uh, sorry, current price, right? Not purchase cost. Times what? Times D7, right? So I got to click on D7 because that's the number of shares. So current value is the number of shares that I own times the current price, correct? So I get equals, then I get this F7 times D7. You notice they're color coded, which I love because it allows me when I click on a cell to look at their cell references. How do I get out of this mode now that I've already put this in? Hit enter. What would happen if I hit escape? It would cancel out and then it'd be an empty cell again. All right, how do I get this formula so it repeats itself? So click on the cell, so it's going to be G7. You can click and hold and drag this down. Another way of doing it is you can simply double click. Right? Now, I'm pretty anal about structure and format. But remember I told you, save the formatting to the end, correct? So here we are, we got the values. What I'm a little concerned about is that I have 50 cents here, then no cents there. I probably want them to either be all together in one fluid, you know, style. All right, let's click on H7. This is how I know I made money or lost money, right? So I look at this column. This is my indicator. I really don't care about the other columns. They're just to set it up for these two columns. How would you calculate gain slash loss? It's very important. Order matters. You are going to subtract the current value. That's what they're going to give you if you sell your stocks today, minus what you paid for them. Sometimes this number will be positive. That means you made money. And sometimes this number will be negative, which means you lose money. So let's do that. How do I put in the formula? Brittany, I'm coming up to you. Small class. I get to pick on everybody now. How would I enter in a formula to do that for H7? Equals. Equals. So click on G7, yeah. and then what I'm going to put after G7? Minus. Minus. Yep. And then what am I going to click on next? E7. Uh, how about E7, the purchase cost? Oh, yeah. right. So we're doing G7 minus E7. I'm going to hold the control key and hit enter. The reason why I'm holding the control key and hitting enter, boy, that's my lucky day. But um, is that it keeps the active pointer there. So this way I can come down here to the fill handle and double click on it. And I saved myself one click, which over the years was going to save arthritis to my knuckles, right? So control enter keeps the active pointer stationary, but it confirms the new change. Clear about that? And by double clicking, it assumes the row with the last content. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Ouch. Did I make money in this whole deal? Overall, did diversification work for me? Well, what's, what's the way of calculating that? When you guys are nodding your heads, what are you using to determine that? Because, you know, I see some negative numbers. Should I be worried? Possibly, but... Oh, come on, leave me alone. But not as much, right? Because you added these numbers up and if you get a positive, that's a good thing. With that region or range selected, come down here to the status bar. 
if you will. You don't have to click on anything. Does it tell you average count and then the sum? That's a nice quick way to get a summary or a total of the values. So I made $513. Gosh, if I've been investing since 2007, should I be proud of that? One of the things I might want to create and which you'll do later is like maybe a history worksheet to keep track of all my transactions. Because maybe I originally bought this, but maybe I sold some shares over time. In fact, this portfolio is very limited in the fact that it doesn't account for that transactions. And that's where we're going to get into databases, where I can make transactions, one I bought and one I sold, so that over the years, I can see my accumulated wealth. Do you see that? This is more of like Johnny on the spot calculating my portfolio. What are they worth now, not assuming that I made some purchases over the years? Because what if over the years I bought this at $16 and I sold them and then I bought them back and forth? So this is my instantaneous feedback, if you will, the moment of my stocks at this given moment, but not the accumulated wealth. All right. How are we going to calculate percentage of portfolio? In a nutshell, somebody explain to me in plain old English, what is a percent? I was talking to my friend last night, and she's been uh, she's first time instructing at Mansfield University, and she's been having some problems with students because they feel that this one project, which is worth 20% of their grade, doesn't have enough point values to it. She put it on a scale of zero to 100. The project's worth 100 points. The students feel like it's worth 200 points, and I said, "Well, sure, make it 200 points, but then make the course." A thousand points. Because what's 200 out of a thousand? 20%. Right? So if that makes them happy, if the, po if the course is worth 500 points, what's 100 out of 500? What's one fifth? 20%. Right? Does it really matter the number of points? She can make it 10 out of what? Do the math. The point is, on my syllabus, and on most instructor's syllabus, they tell you how much a particular thing, like your exams are worth 40%. Does it matter how many points each exams are worth? No. That's what's nice about percentages. They're relative. They count for that that they're based out of 100. So even if I say that I have $20 out of a total of $100, that's 20% wealth or 20% profit. Does that make sense? We look at these things. Of course, quantity does matter. But my concern is really, out of respect with the total what are the contributing factors? In other words, what's my big contributor? What's my all-star performer when it comes to my stocks? Is it best to look at the dollar values? Like I can see Disney's worth $2,841. Or is it better to look at the percentage of my portfolio? Things get a little fun here. Let's find out. How would we do the percentage or the portfolio? First of all, does it make sense to do it by the number of shares? Because it looks like TC has the majority of shares. Should I do my percentage based off of the number of shares? No? Well, what do I care about when it comes to investment? Money, correct? I want to know the percentage of my shares that are producing the majority of my wealth. So maybe I should be focusing on money. Well, the sales that deal with money are purchase price, purchase cost, current price, current value. Out of those columns, which one should I be focusing my attention on? Does it make sense to do purchase price? 
So this is the challenge in Excel. It's not really using Excel as much as knowing what numbers to use in your calculations. In fact, this is the biggest issue with math, right? Everybody knows how to add, but what should we add? Because this is simply a division problem. But we need to know what we need to divide and what do we need to add. Hmm. Well, purchase price really means nothing to me. That just says what the stocks was worth at the day that I bought them. It's not showing me the instantaneous percentage of my portfolio. What about purchase cost? Does that change? That's fixed. It's what I bought these shares, or sorry, these stocks at, at that day. So that excludes these. Current price is changing all the time, but it's not really change, it's not really showing me my total value, right? Because total value is the current price times the share, which leads me only to this column right here. This is showing me how much each stocks are worth, correct? At this given moment. What is the percentage? How do you calculate your grade? You add up all the points that you earned, correct? And divide it by the total possible points. The key here is total possible points, right? So how about you click underneath or click on cell G11? And what will that do? Should place the active cur cursor, sorry, active cell pointer underneath the total, no sorry, underneath all your stocks. And I like to do is I like to add these all up. Can anybody tell me how you can quickly add these values from here to here? Now we just learned how to do formulas, right? We said equals, and then we click on this, we click on this, hit the plus key, then click on that, hit the plus key and click on this, hit the plus key and click on that. There's a fundamental flaw here. Remember, I want to make this worksheet scalable so it grows. So if as I add more and more stocks to my portfolio, what would I need to do to this cell here? Add more and more cell referencing? Well, that's not very scalable. That's not very user friendly. What else? It takes forever to do it, so it's not fast. And it's a little prone to errors because the more and more cell references I add to it, the more convoluted it becomes. So tell me, folks, what is the quickest way to teach Excel what cells to add? Auto sum or the sum function. Remember, we talked about functions before? How they're a list of instructions? Well, isn't this the instruction that we're going to get? Start here and add every value between here and there. Correct? So click on this cell up above under the Home tab in the Editing group, and don't ask me why they put it there. There's a little summation symbol there. Looks like a goofy E, like an S and an E joined together. It's called Sigma. Click on that triangle right next to it, and click on Sum. Did the spreadsheet automatically guess correctly? Yeah, I want these values between here. How did it know where to stop? This was a label. Labels aren't used in calculations, correct? There is nothing to the left or right of it or below it. So it made the assumption there's something above it. Keep on going. Let's hit Enter. So currently I'm worth $5,289.30. Uh, sorry, 30 cents. I'm not retiring anytime soon. But I want to take this number and use it over here in this cell so I can calculate what the big contributors are per stock. So let's click on I7. So percentage. What the person earned out of the total possibility, correct? This stock is worth $2,884.50 out of my total worth, correct? So how do I get a percent? Vanessa, what formula would you use to put in here? What's that? So you got to say equals. And what are you going to put after the equal symbol? Click on G7. Very good. And what are you going to put after that? Division symbol. Yep. The slash. Okay. 
So you put the division symbol in there. Remember, this is a forward slash, right? It's leaning forward. That's the way you can tell that. G11, because it's that part out of the total. Very good. Hit enter. Should that number go beyond uh, 1? Percentages always go from 0 to 1, if you will. OK? So it says to me that Disney's making up about 54% of my portfolio. That might be scary for me that I'm relying on more than half of my retirement on one company. Do you see where percentages come in? Hmm. Okay, now didn't we learn something that's pretty cool? You just click on I7, you grab that little fill handle and you drag it down. Wait a minute. Up until this point, it was working. We were enjoying this. We were lazy. We just grabbed that fill handle and said, hey, you know the routine. Do it. I taught you how to take and calculate the percentage for this particular stock. Now apply it for the rest of the stocks. Why does Excel give me a bunch of shit? By the way, when you get this, it's a mathematical error. Can you guys divide by zero? Nah, it's a little funny. All right, so let's click away from that. And let's click on I7. Oh, sorry, I8. When you click on I8, come up to the formula bar and click anywhere in the formula bar. The reason why I want you to come up top and click on the formula bar is when I do that, it shows me those pretty colors, correct? Is this blue cell right? Should it be 93 over here? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, this is what GE is worth, right? It's what it's worth divided by the total contributions, correct? Wait a minute. Why is the green cell below the $5,289? Because both cells were using relative cell addressing, right? Do you notice the blue cell went down? In fact, hit the escape key, click on I7, go up to the formula bar and click in there. So you notice the blue cell went down and the green cell went down because they moved accordingly, correct? In fact, when you click on this cell, you'll notice that the green box is probably down here. Let's find out. Hit the escape key, click on I10, and then click on the formula bar. And as you can see, the green cell is down there. Now my goal is to make this worksheet user friendly. Is this user friendly? As we add more and more stocks, what's going to happen to the location of that cell? It's always going to be at the bottom of everything, correct? All right, so we talked about relative cell addressing. Let's talk about absolute cell addressing. There's got to be some way to tell Excel that this cell is allowed to move, but this cell's not. Case in point, when you're doing divisions, totals will probably always be in one location, but the results will probably be staggered, right? So let's try this. Let's click on I7. Let's go up in the formula bar. So click once in the formula bar. Out of those two cell re uh, references, the blue and the green, which one should stay put? The green? All right, click between the column reference and the row reference. So in this case, I'm going to click between G and the 11. So my insertion point's right between those. Hit the F4 key on your keyboard. It's the very top function key. When you do it, does it add two little uh, dollar signs? One next to the G, one next to the uh, 11? Well, there is no little padlock symbol in your keyboards, okay folks? So I want you to think of that dollar sign as a little padlock. We good about that? So when a dollar sign is next to the letter G, it's locking the column. So as you move the cell from column to column, it'll always stay at G. That's what the little dollar sign next to the G is saying. What about the dollar sign next to 11? Locking the row, right? So as it moves down, it's always going to stay. Technically, that's the only thing I should have to lock here, right? Because as I'm moving these down, 
I'm going from row to row to row. So if you hit F4 again, you can see you're cycling through. This becomes a mixed cell address. Now I'm leaving the column as relative, but the row as absolute. Hit F4 again. Do you see that the column's locked, but the row isn't? Hit F4 again, and now it's back to relative. So you see how it cycles through those four things. Relative, absolute, lock row, lock column. The only thing I need is locking the column. So hit the F4 key until you get a dollar sign next to, sorry, lock row, next to the 11. Hit Enter. Grab I7 and fill it to be to I10. By the way, just some quick check and balance, because that's what math's all about. What should these numbers all add up to be? One, right? You only have one portfolio here. If you come down here and you check the little sum there, did it add to a one? Now personally at this time, being that those are highlighted, I would go ahead and format these as percents. I do not format them prior to that because sometimes you get a goofy large number. Percents should be decimals. So after they're all calculated and highlighted, come up to the home tab in the number group, click on the percent symbol. Did it cut off the uh, decimals? And then did it uh, like sort of move the decimal point two places over? It only does that visually. Technically, a percentage is always decimals. All right. What other cool things can we do? Well, how about we format this as a table? So I want you guys to highlight from A6 down to I11. Now there's a difference between tables and worksheets. In a moment you're going to find out. So with this highlighted, come up to the styles group under the home tab and click format as table. So click on that triangle next to format as table. Now when I think of money I'm thinking green. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose this very first light table style. Okay? You guys can pick whatever one you want. I'm just going to choose this one. Do I have a little marquee around those selected regions? Did it, uh, sorry, did a pop-up box come up? Uh, does it say basically your cell regions and then the little check marks, my table has headers? Make sure you leave that on there. Click OK. All right, click off the table. Do you notice when I made this a table, I have triangles pointing down next to each column reference? This is the difference between a worksheet and a table. Watch this. Click on the triangle next to stock. You see how you can sort things now? I want you to sort these from A to Z. Or is it already from A to It is. You won't know. How about Z to A? Bless you. So do sort from Z to A. Now back in the day, this was always challenging because when you sorted a column, only the column values would be sorted and not their respective cells. Translation, this stock has a purchase date, a price, the quantity, and so on and so forth. Back in 2003, when we were using Excel and we sorted this stuff, our values would get joggled. In other words, these other values would have stayed at their same row and only these would have changed. And the way we fixed it is we made these into tables. And what is a table? It's just a bunch of cells that are related to each other. Does that make sense? This cell is related to this cell and this cell and so on. Look at the other thing you can do. This is called a filtering. If you click on that triangle next to the stock, remove the check where it says select all, and put a check next to TC and click OK. Did it delete those rows? No, it just, just sorry, took them away from your display. How do you know those rows aren't deleted? 
Look over here at the row counter. It only says eight, right? Then it jumps to 12. So I'm missing seven, nine, 10, and 11. That's because they're turned off. Let's go back to that little filter. Put a check in the little box with the dot, black dot in it next to select all and click OK. You also notice that these, this table's banded. In other words, every other row is filled with a color. That makes it easier for your person to read this. Click anywhere in the table. Do you notice we have a new tab that appears up in the ribbon? Click on that design tab. We call this contextual. That means that Excel doesn't show you all the available tabs. It'll show you tabs that are available for every object you click on. When I click on a table tab, uh, sorry, table, I get the table tab. Do you notice I have the check mark next to banded rows? Remove that check mark so you guys can see what's happening. Do you see now everything's all white? Click on that. Back in the day, we didn't have that lovely, sorry, lovely feature, so I always made my students do this manually. Could you imagine doing that for a 100-row spreadsheet, filling in every other row with a different color? And then could you imagine if you had to delete a row and then change every other color from that point forward? Yeah, very lovely feature. I want you guys to put a check mark next to total row. Ouch, what happened? It put a total row right in row 12, but isn't this my total row? I mean, after all, that $5,289 was the total of my stocks. Hmm, I can't fix that other than deleting it. So I want you guys to right click on row 11 and choose delete. Ooh. What happened? Do you guys have this reference error? Okay, remember these cells were pointing to this value right here, but I deleted it, correct? All right, let's click over here under current value in the total row. When I click on that, do you have a magical triangle that points down? Oh, I'm loving this. Watch what happens. You click on that triangle pointing down. How about you click on sum? Did you guys have to pick any of the cell references? Do you see right then and there, you can just click on sum, hit enter. Uh-oh. Did I fix this problem over here? Let's go back to I7. Do you see up in the formula bar it's telling you where the reference is wrong? Let's click on that. Remove that pound symbol followed by ref explanation point. And what am I going to click on next after I do that? Make sure your blinking cursor is to the right of that division symbol. Click on, yep. So don't type in G11, just click on G11. Watch what happens when you guys click on G11. Do you see you have this thing called value now? Hit enter. Did it fix it back to 25%? All right, when you make tables, we're no longer referencing them by cell addresses, but by their actual reference, sorry, by their actual location, if you will. That's because every cell in a row is part of a record, which we're going to get into when we talk about database theory on Thursday. So can we grab this fill handle and drag it down? Are we back to normal? Does it still add up to be 100%? Does it make sense for me to have this 100% here? Nah, I'm just going to click on that and hit delete. Now, we're all talking about formatting. In accounting and even other, in other courses or other uh, math classes that you might have, there's a certain border that sort of dictates 
like sums and totals. Can anybody tell me the style of that border? How does that border look? Is it a single line or a double line? It's all about visual cues. It's either a double line or it's a thick line to represent that the numbers above it have been added together. Double line? Let's do that. I want you guys to highlight the cells between B11 over to I11. Click on the Home tab. Okay. Do you see I have a border group right here? Click on the triangle next to it. So in the font group, click on that triangle. And come down here where it says More Border Options. Of course, you can do it right from here, but I'd rather you guys do it from More Borders. Over here, I want you guys to click on this double style. And as you can see, I have a slew of choices here. I want this double border to represent the top of these cells. So let me click on this button right here. When I click on that, in my preview, I get the double borders. Let's click OK. Now, I might not be able to see it because this region still selected. Let me click off of that. And do I have my double border? Maybe I should have probably put the double border over there. Let's do that. So click on it once. Click on the More Border button. So click on the triangle next to that. Choose More Borders. Choose Double. Click on the button above. And click OK. Mm, it's black. I wish it was that lime green. And there's no need to have this border underneath it. So let's do this. Select from A11 back to I11. Come up to that More Border button. And click on More Borders. Interesting. Where it says Color, click on that nasty lime green color. Choose that Top Border button. And what it should do is change it to green. Is that what it does? Do you notice the bottom of the border, the, sorry, the bottom of those cells doesn't have any borders? So when I click OK, I see that they do exist though. There is borders. Well, why don't you highlight the cells from A12 to I12 and do the same thing. Go back up to the border button, click on more borders. Does that have anything there? Hmm. Click on None for the style. And then come over here and click on this preset called None. Just to be thorough. And click OK. Did that take it away? Well, let's try clicking from A11 to A, uh, sorry, I11. Click on the More Borders button. This time what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this button to toggle it on and off. And I'm going to click OK. And I'm still not getting any luck. Can anybody tell me why I can't turn off that bottom border? What does that bottom border represent? Just like what does this top border represent? It's the table, right? Yeah, so where do you think you'd go to make table changes? You click on it. You go to Table Design. And in there, you should be able to edit your style. Right? After all, didn't we pick a style here? And then in there, you guys can remove the bottom border. As far as I'm concerned, I'm just showing you the difference between tables and cells. Everybody's good about that? All right. Let's talk about uh, column widths. I want this table to basically expand the width of my sheet of paper. Hmm. In order to do that, I'm going to change my view. 
Let's come over here and click on the middle button. We've already talked about zooming in and zooming out. By clicking on the middle button down the status bar, I will be activating what we call the page layout view. This is a feature that's new to 2007. And trust me, this is a feature that Excel has been needing for a very long time. And it actually shows students what they're used to when they're using Microsoft Word, right? What does this thing look like on a sheet of paper? Let's highlight the columns from A to I. Do you notice you also see the margins and the footers and the headers? Something you wouldn't do in normal view. I only go to this view when I'm about to print or if I'm making some format changes. Right click on any one of those highlighted columns. I'm going to right click on A and choose column width. Do you notice it shows me an inch symbol here? Now I have no clue what these cells should be. I'm going to take a guess and make them one inch wide. So let me type in one followed by the inch symbol, that's the double quote. And let me click OK. Did I go a little too much over? Do you see how it spilled over to this new page? The way you know it takes up two pages now is down here in the status bar it says page one of two. My whole purpose was to make this so it just fits one page. So I guess I guessed too much. One inch was too much. Right click on A. Go back to column width. And let's try .85 inches. So make sure you put .85 followed by the inch symbol and click OK. I'm going to leave it there. I don't want to make it any smaller because I'm concerned it might cut off the dates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the page margins so that they're half inch all the way around instead of what they are right now. So let's go to page layout. So click on the page layout tab. And where it says margins, let's click on that triangle pointing down. And right now it's at normal, right? And you see that the left is 0.7 and the right is 0.7. Let's choose narrow for a second. But that gives me a, a quarter inch here and a quarter inch there. But what I really want is a half inch on both sides, correct? But I didn't have that preset. So what can I do to make it so that the margins are half inch all the way around? Custom. Click on the margins command on the page layout and choose custom. And let's do that. Where it says left, click the up arrow once. Where it says right, click it once. Where it says top, click it down. And where it says bottom, click it down. So now it should be half inch all the way around. And I'm, while I'm here, put a check mark where it says center it horizontally. And let's click OK. Isn't that a little funny? I made it a half inch. But what happened to my layout of my page? I spilled over, correct? But did I change the orientation by chance? Could you guys come up there and click on the orientation? Does it make sense to make this table fit on a page that's this wide? If the table's wider, maybe we should rotate the page. Change it to landscape. Oh, wow. Looks like I have a whole, bu a whole bunch more, correct? So right click on those cells. Once again, go back to column width. Let's make it one inch again and see how well we prosper. I'm going to have to zoom out so I can actually see the width of my page. And as you guys can see, I can actually make these columns even more wider if I needed to. I'm going to leave it the way it is because I'm going to be using this cell later, but I'm happy with the results. I'm also here, I might as well add a few other things. Let's click anywhere in the header. Let's click on the upper left corner of the header. 
Now you've seen some of this in Word where we had to insert page numbers that automatically update it, insert the date. I want you guys to click on header, the triangle underneath header. And I want you guys to come down here where it should say my name if all goes well, and Andre, page one, and date. But how do I give you credit when you click on that preset for headers and it says my username and not my actual name? What is that called, by the way, when a program like Word or Excel uses some data stored in the file that you've never entered in before to do redundant data like page numbers and the date automatically? They're called document elements or fields. Let's save our work. And I'm going to show you guys how to update this document element so it has your name. Go to File. When you guys click on File, come over here where it says Properties and click under that triangle next to Properties. And click on Show Document Panel. By the way, this works for all the Office applications. When you guys do that, does this appear? And lo and behold, where it says Author, do you see the N. Andre? Change it so it has your name. This metadata can be used by Windows to actually search down the documents. If there's certain keywords like portfolio, stocks, investment, you could put them in here and separate them by commas or semicolons. Sorry, semicolon, uh, columns, semicommas. And then hit categories or whatever. But for all I care about is the author name. Close out of this document properties panel. And it says, would you like for me to use this for the autocomplete from now on? Please click yes. Did it change the uh, N. Andre? Click back on N. Andre. Go back to the design tab. Click under the triangle underneath header. And click on, now it should say your name page and date. Does it say it there now? Scroll down below. Click in the middle of the footer. Do you notice when you hover over a footer area or a header area, it breaks it down into three parts, left, center, and right. Click on the center part and type in stock portfolio. and then click off of there. I have a dilemma. I apparently made my headers and footers too short, right? Do you see where it says stock portfolio? It's overlapping by one of the cell grid lines. That's no problem. Go back up to page layout. Click on margins. Click on custom margin. This time, make the top back to seven, oh, sorry, three quarters, so 0 0.7, and the bottom 0 0.7. The way I did is I just clicked in the box, put a seven next to the five, and then I'm going to click OK again. As you can see, my headers are a little bit more reasonable. When I hover over them, I get a bigger blue area now. A few more things to tweak this thing up. Let's go back to the normal view. As you can see, the headers should disappear as well as the margins. Let's click on A2 and type in initial amount invested. Hit the tab key a couple times. What am I going to put in C2? What's that? I'm, I need to total up the purchase cost. But wait a minute. Don't I have a row that does the totals for me? 
So think of this area up here as a summary of what the table is. So what I need to do is go back to the table, click on E11, click on the drop down box, and choose sum. And let me do the same thing for shares as well as current price. Uh, no, not current price. Uh, gain and loss is the other one I need to do. Do I need to do any more? It should just be these values right here. Now go back to C2, click equal, and then click on E11. Once again, you'll see we no longer are referencing sales. We're saying table one's total purchase costs. If we hit enter, we're at 4,000, no different than there. All this cell is doing is referencing the contents of that cell. I didn't have to do any adding, dividing, or subtraction. I can just say this cell points to that. Where does this come in handy? When you create another worksheet and you call that worksheet a summary worksheet. All right, let's click on A3. Type in current portfolio value. Hit the tab key a couple of times. Hit equals, then click on the 5200, which it would be G11, and hit enter. And then now I have to ask you guys another math question. What is the percentage change formula? I want to know overall, has my portfolio grown, and if so, by how much? See, these percentages over here was indicating performance by each individual stocks. This percentage up here is showing the overall performance of my portfolio. So what is the percent change? Well, the idea is I don't get a number that's 112%, but rather just simply 12%. So in order for me to calculate that, I need to remove the original amount, correct? So let's type in equals parentheses because order does matter. Click on C2, put in the minus symbol. Oh, wait a minute. My apologies. Did I tell you guys C2? It should be C3. So remove C2, then click on C3, then put a minus, then click on C2. Translation, I'm removing the initial amount from this, okay? Put a right parenthesis in there. Put your division symbol in there. So it should read equals left parenthesis, C3 minus C2, right parenthesis, divide, and then click back on C2. Yes, the same cell can be used multiple times over within the same formula. Hit enter. Click on C4, make that a percent for me. So you click on C4, you click on home, click on the percent symbol in the number group, and you can see my stock portfolio went down a little bit, but I'm still at 11%. Hmm. Let's merge these cells. So let's click on A2 to B2. Come up underneath the alignment group and click on that A symbol that has two arrows pointing in opposite directions. And do the same thing with A3 to B3 and A4 to B4. What that allows us to do is that these contents are appears and now in one acting cell, if you will. Let's select A2 down to uh, A4. Change the alignment so it's right aligned. Click on C2 to C3. 
Click on the dollar symbol in the number group. Let's talk about removing the decimal places. Up in that number group, you have two decimal icons. One points to the left to increase the decimal places. The other one points to the right to decrease. Click on the one that points to the right to decrease. You might have to click on that twice. And now you have the dollar symbol there, not next to the numbers. Why is that? When you click on this dollar symbol in the number group, you are implying the accountant's default format. Accountants put the dollar symbols to the far left. This way you don't mistake it for being a five or something like that. But I want the dollar symbol right next to that. So let's click on the triangle next to custom and choose currency. By the way, that's in the number group. And once again, click on the decimal places pointing to the right. And now you have that. Let's click on C7. Apply the accountant's format. So click on that once. Highlight from 8, sorry, C8 down to C10. You notice it says general right now? Click on that general box in the number group and choose number. Make sure it has two decimal places. If it doesn't, add the appropriate ones. You might have to click left or right until you get two decimal places. Do the same thing for purchase cost, current price, current value, gain and loss. So this becomes the accountant. These become numbers. Make sure they have both have two decimal places. If there's a value in the total, please uh, adjust that accordingly. Make that an accountant format. Now, it would probably make these numbers easier to read if a comma would appear. So I'm going to highlight this range from C8 down to G10, or H10, sorry. So from C8 to H10. And with them highlighted, I'm just going to simply click on this comma symbol up top. Now in your uh, lab exercise, you guys are going to get into something called conditional formatting. Can you guys tell me what conditional formatting is in a nutshell? You notice we've been doing this formatting? It's very static. That is, this format that we made these numbers will always stay and they won't change no matter what the results are. Do you see over here though, in my gain loss column, I have numbers that are in parentheses. Why are they in parentheses? By the way, that happened when I clicked on the comma. They're negative. And once again, the way accountants represent negative numbers are by putting them in parentheses. Now by chance, if you had associated a color with a positive number and a negative number, what color would you use to represent negative numbers? Why does everybody have a thing against red? What's the color of corning? So what are you guys trying to say? Is this a negative place? <laughs> All right, let's highlight these numbers. And uh, the only time we're probably going to get a negative number is when we do the gain loss, because that's where we did some subtraction. So let's highlight G, uh, sorry, H7 down to H10. And now we're going to apply a rule. 
that's going to implement what we call conditional formatting. Remember that conditional statement we talked about in programming? If a condition's met, then do the following, correct? What do you think the condition will have to be for that to represent red negative numbers? How do you guys know a number is negative? Don't tell me because it's a little dash. What is the definition of a negative number? If you look at the number line, is it greater than zero or less than zero? Less than zero, right? So if this number is less than zero, what does it imply? It's negative. So by me highlighting this region, I'm going to come up top and next to the conditional formatting, I'm going to click on that triangle. We're going to do the highlight cell rules. You can do a whole bunch if you want. You can even make your own custom rule. And then we're going to choose this option that says less than. And all we have to do is put a zero right in here. If this condition is met, it's going to, conf it's going to format it the following with light text, uh, sorry, light red fill and a dark red text. Should I change the fill or not? Well, if I want to customize this, click on the triangle next to light red fill with dark text and just click on red text and click OK. Do those numbers stand out now? Let's make that number positive by chance. And the way we're going to make that number positive is we're going to lie. We're going to cook the books. We're going to click on F8 and say that that's 33.2. And you see when I change those results, this number now appears green. And you see my percentages and everything else adjust accordingly. Stocks change all the time. I've been killing enough time that when we first started this exercise, the market was closed, right? The bell should have rung. Now we can do this in one of two ways. We can manually go and find what the current prices are, or we can teach our spreadsheet that simple thing of fetching, bringing it back, and executing, right? Let's save this. When Microsoft first developed a product, they developed a programming language called BASIC. BASIC allowed people to write code to develop applications. What is an application? As you guys are finding out in this last coming weeks before we have our final, sorry, before we have our exam on software. What is software? Plain old English, folks. What do you think it is? We wrote some wrote some code, I should say. What is software? It's a list of instructions. It tells the operating system how to use the hardware. Correct? It's knowledge. I wrote a little bit of code that teaches the software, Excel, how to do something so trivial as fetching stock quotes. In order to execute this program, you need to click on cells a7 to D7 and watch this thing fail. So you're highlighting the tickers because we need input, correct? The user supplies the application with input. This is the input that ultimately determines what the current prices are, correct? With that highlighted, do you guys have the developer tab up there? If you do not have the developer tab, what you will have to do is come over here to the Office tab, sorry, the File tab now. Click on Options. Please do this because this might affect you at home. And click on Customize Ribbon. Over here on the right, you will have a list of different tabs that are available. Like for instance, I don't care for the Add-on tab. So I'm going to remove that check mark next to add on. And when I do that, when I click OK, you will see that the add on tab disappeared up top. By the way, if you do not have the developers tab, what would you do? Put a check mark next to the developer, correct? 
Let's click on the Developer tab. When you write code for any Office application, it's called a macro. Let's click on the macros. By the way, you see Visual Basic, Microsoft's programming language, if you will. Let's click on macros. Do you guys have this macro called get data? This is just a function. Let's click run. Did these things change for you now? Remember, this was what, 33.2? Now it's down to $3.30. I want to show you that code. I do not expect you guys to be able to develop in VBA, let alone in any programming language. But I want to show you the power this allows for you as business people to be able to save yourself a whole bunch of time. So let's do that. Let's click on the Visual Basic Editor up top. You might have to double click on this title bar right here. And I'm just going to give you a cursory run through of what this does. This is a function called get data. Remember what functions are, just reusable code, right? This area up here, just memory addresses. That's all. Remember I talked about object programming? I have an object that represents a worksheet. That object is called the query sheet. I also have another one called sh. That's the sheet that you're currently in. But worksheets have properties. They have components, like cells, correct? So by declaring these objects, I'm able to access those properties. So you see my URL? What have we learned? What is a URL from last week's class? Tell me what the three letters mean. Uniform Resource Locator, correct? I said anything that's put on the internet, we're giving it a generic name called a resource, correct? One of the resources that are available is this app, this web app supplied by Yahoo. Do you see the name of the service is called Quote? After all, isn't that what we get when we do a stock lookup? I'm saying go to Yahoo, activate the Quote service, and that Quote service is going to produce a file. And in that file is going to contain my answer. So as I scroll down through here, you see I have a little work, sorry, a couple of loop statements. That means they're going to go through each and every one of those stocks repeating the same steps. Go to Yahoo, grab the data, and place it right here in this table. And that's what this add does. It says add the data to that query table. When it gets done adding it, Go to that portfolio worksheet. Remember down at the bottom of Excel? That worksheet was called portfolio. And grab each of those values. Here's the range. Remember the stocks. You selected those. Jump five columns over. That's what the offset means. Five columns over from the current stocks should be the current price, correct? And store that. You see I have an equal symbol there? Take the answer that you grabbed from up here and put it in that cell. Now it says bump counter. All that's doing is going to the next stock, and the next stock, and the next stock. To the point where you guys can close out of that now. So click on the red X. That if I right click on number 11 and choose insert and click on A11, I can type in any stocks. Let's type in F. By the way, it's got to be a legitimate ticker. Hit the tab key. What's today's date? 19th? So put 3 slash 19 slash 13. Hit the tab key. Uh, let's say we purchased them at $5. Hit the tab key. Let's say we spent $100 on those. Hit the tab key. Did it automatically calculate that? Oops, I haven't taught my table the new formula. So let me click on E10, double click. And while I'm at it, let me grab from G10 to G, uh, sorry, to I10, and then grab the fill handle and drag down. All I'm doing is copying those formulas above these three cells and bringing them down. 
All right, to grab that value. Now this macro is important. This is the macro that you make somebody develop for you, but you're going to be using this all the time. Is this convenient by going up to the Developers tab, clicking on Macro, and then clicking on that and hitting Run? No. You want to be able to add this into a location that's com that you're comfortable with. So let's do this. Let's go up to File. Let's go back down to Options. By the way, this can work on any of the Office programs. Let's click on Customize Ribbon. Click on New Tab. Go up here in this little list box, click on the New Tab button. Click on Rename. Type in Custom Macros. Hit OK. Click on the New Group. Hit Rename. Now you might get a nice little series of icons, but where it says Display Name, Company Macros. Click OK. Now that just developed a new tab in the ribbon. By the way, the ribbon is the upper area that contains all the commands, as you well know. Now I need to go find that macro. Do you see where it says choose commands from and it says popular commands? Click on that arrow pointing down. Click on macros. Click on this workbook.getData. And then click the add button. Before you click on the add button, make sure that the company macros is still highlighted, okay? This way you're adding it to that group. Now it should be like this little hierarchy. Custom, company macros, this workbook.getData. Okay? You could rename it, but for all intents and purposes, this is good for now. Let's click OK. Let's select cells A7 through F11. Come up top, click on the Custom Macros tab, the new tab you guys just made. Now you have that command called this workbook.getData. Click on that. And if all goes well, Ford's ticker should appear there. And from now on, all I have to do is select my symbols and keep on clicking this button. And I can see that this workbook's values will automatically update. Could I write a script that'll do it every 60 seconds? Absolutely. What did we do? We managed to take two worlds that were once divided, that didn't see any correlation, and bridge them together. That is, the traditional desktop apps and merged them with web technology. What did it take to do that? A couple lines of code. That's all. Now, there was a lot going on. I wanted to cover the issues with Excel that most students have. I didn't get to creating the pie chart. We'll come back towards that as a review for your final, sorry, for your exam two. I didn't get a chance to explore min max functions, but all functions are the same, whether it's min max or sum. There are other functions more elaborate, like the present value of something, which once again I will do when I come back to review for exam two. However, what I wanted to accomplish was to show you guys, finally, what applications are becoming. That is, applications are becoming more lively because of our connection to the web. The web consists of many different technologies that allows us to accomplish one common task. That is to share resources. Whether those resources are communications, money, knowledge, or entertainment. The World Wide Web has made it possible for us to interact on a whole nother level, whether it's with each other or with applications. So on Thursday's class, we'll get into database technology and how that is the backbone for any dynamic web page.
You guys take care. I will see you on Thursday.